I'm Marshall Goldsmith. I am an executive educator. I am an author and I am an executive coach. And welcome to my LinkedIn live show today. And here we are with Ruth Godian. Ruth is wonderful. She is a wonderful person. She's been doing research for years on the topic of success. She's an author, she's an educator, and she has a brand new book, which is spectacular, called The Success Factor. Ruth, Ruth, welcome, welcome, welcome. Hello, my friend, Marshall. How are you? So good to be here with you. Oh, I'm doing just great. I'm doing just great. So happy to have you on the show. All right. We've got a series of questions. Are you ready? I, I am ready, Marshall. Question number one, what do high achievers have in common? Well, you know that you've been working with high achievers for a very, very long time, and you've probably seen these common elements that they all have. And now, I've actually... Now, 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 wait a minute. When I said, what do high achievers have in common? I don't think they have in common. You talk to old people and say, very, very, very long time. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what I meant to say is you are so experienced in this. Better, better, better. better. <laughs> and we probably know some of the same people because I've been interviewing Nobel Prize winners and astronauts and Olympic champions to figure out what has made them so successful. And I realized that a Nobel Prize winning scientist is just like an astronaut or an Olympian. So what are the four things that they all have in common? And trust me, Marshall, it, they're all the same. You ready for the four? Yes, I am. All right. The first one, they love what they do. And I don't mean you find your passion, you'll never work a day in your life. I mean, this is what they were put on this earth to do. There's a fire in their belly. It's not what they want to do. It's what they have to do. They can't not do it. So they're not motivated by what we call in adult learning extrinsic motivation. They're not motivated by awards, promotions, diplomas, gold medals. It's never about that. It's about the intrinsic motivation, that fire that comes from within. So that's the first one. You ready for number two? I am ready. All right. When you find what you love doing, you are going to outwork everybody. It's that work ethic, tenacity, resilience, grit, perseverance, whatever you want to call it. Yes. It's really about not just working 18-hour days. It's not about that. It's working smarter, figuring out your peak performance hours and leveraging that time to do your work. It's Good. also the way you look at challenges. So the high achievers, they have this confidence. They never question if they will overcome a challenge. They know they'll get over it, through it, under it, around it. They will get to the other side. It's never a question of if. It's always a question of how. What is the strategy I haven't thought of in order to solve this problem, to solve this challenge? So it's a complete mind shift from <laughs> if to how. And when you switch it that way to how, you are now in control. And high achievers love to control what they can control. And by doing that, they're actually able to move things forward. So that's two. Ready now, for wait, number wait, three, Marshall? Wait, wait a minute. Now on that one. Yes. A really fascinating connection, which I did not make until right now. Tell me. My, my good friend, Alan Mulally at Ford points out that when an exogenous event occurs in most companies, you know, typhoon, problem, weather, some Pandemic. kind of breakdown. Their <laughs> first reaction is typically change the goal. Yeah. His reaction, no, you do not change the goal. That's right. You figure out how to be creative and solve the problem. So it's kind of, uh, it, your research is very, I will tell him this, your research is very consistent with what he does because he doesn't focus on if, he focuses on how. You see? And when you do that, you get creative. That's right. That's right. He's just like an astronaut. Tell him that. <laughs> you might like that. Yeah. You're well, I, I don't know if you know this, but totally aside, he wanted to be an astronaut. Really? Yeah, but he had a slight color blindness and he got you know kicked out back in the day. But yeah, he was in astronaut school. So yeah, it was very interesting. Wow. Very interesting. Yeah. Small world. Small, Small world. world. Okay. What's number three? Number three. 
It's about having a strong foundation, which is constantly being reinforced. What you did early in your career, you're going to do later in your career. Look at all the great basketball players. Kobe Bryant was known for being at the gym early in the morning, doing his layups, doing his jump shots. You can ask any of the NBA players. They'll tell you that those are the same things that they did as little kids. Any junior high gym, you'll see people warming up in the same way. The NBA players just have bigger salaries and better equipment, but it's exactly the same. In fact, one of the people who I interviewed was Neil Katyal. Neil Katyal, some people may know him from television. He actually argued 45 cases before the Supreme Court of the United States, more than any other lawyer. Most lawyers don't do one. He's done 45. And Neil told me that to prepare for the case, he's prepared in the same way for each one of his 45 cases. Hmm. He prepares the binder that has every question he might get asked. And then he prepares the answers. And he walks into the Supreme Court on the table in front of him. He puts down the binder. And he told me he's never once opened this binder. But just the practice of preparing it prepared him for the case. <laughs> the second thing he did was he actually held moot courts. These are simulated courts. He's done that for every single one of the 45 cases. And last but not least, Marshall, you're a dad. You know those bedtime stories? Well, if you're Neil Katyal's kids, your bedtime story, the night before opening arguments, become the opening arguments of the case. <laughs> <laughs> Because if it's clear enough for a child to understand, it's going to be clear enough for the court to understand. He's done that for 45 cases, never changed the way he did. And that's why he's argued so many. And it worked for him. Ooh, that's wonderful. You ready for number four? Yes. All right. So I see all those books behind you. And I know that you love to read. And you're like all the billionaires, Mark Cuban and Warren Buffett and Bill Gates, they're notorious for their love of reading. But it's not reading that made them so successful. It's actually being open to new knowledge mm -hmm. and making connections that other people don't yet see. And it's borrowing something from one industry and doing it slightly <laughs> differently in another industry. Mm -hmm. So they love to read. But for people who don't love to read or don't have three to eight hours a day, well, what are some of the other ways that they can open their mind up to new knowledge? Well, you can read books, you can read articles, you can watch um, webinars, listen to podcasts, listen to LinkedIn Live. Hopefully we're sharing good stuff here, Marshall, right? TED Talks, LinkedIn Learning Courses, they're, they're really, it's endless if you want to learn it's all there. And last but not least, you can also learn by talking to people. Marshall, how long and how many times have we spent talking to each other and how much I have learned from you? And this is something that all high achievers do. They learn from other people. And that's what's so important. And not just one person, they have a team of mentors around them who can advise them and believe in them more than they believe in themselves. And those are the four elements. That's what all high achievers do. And I believe we can all learn how to do this. You know, you mentioned learning from other people. You're a member of our fun group, the 100 Coaches. Yes. So share that as an example of how we can all learn from each other. The 100 Coaches is a group that I am blessed to be a part of. This is Marshall's brainchild where he decided he is going to teach some of the top coaches and the top leaders in the world, everything that he knows for free. And my week does not start off right if I am not connected on this Zoom meeting on Monday mornings. Best professional development there is because every week we learn something different. And the reason I love this group is that it's the most eclectic group. There are no two people who do the same thing. Marshall is the number one executive coach in the world. I work in academia. We have an NFL Hall of Famer. We have people from literally every industry. And when there's a question that's posed, that we actually hear perspectives from different people. 
And trust me, it is just a boost to your system when you can start activating your mind that way. And you hear something and you say, oh, I never thought of it that way. Or someone mentions something and you start to think deeper into something that was just passing in your mind before. And I think we've all become better from that because we can learn from each other. The other thing that has become so great from that group, from 100 Coaches, is it has opened up so many collaborations with people who do different things. So when you combine different people together, it actually produces something that's so much better than anyone could have done on their own. And that's why I love, love my Monday mornings with Marshalls and the 100 coaches. Hey, now this ne next question. <laughs> These traits of high achievers, are they yeah. just born with it or do they learn it? So um, <laughs> I think that leaders are absolutely can be made. I really think they can learn to do things. I don't think anyone was born with these skills. People were born with a talent. But Marshall, we all know a lot of people who are born with talent and they're just sitting on the couch all day. They right. are wasting it away. So if you have a talent, what you do with it and how you craft it and who you surround yourself with, who can raise your bar of excellence and make it even better, that's what it's all about. So you can absolutely learn this. And when I realized that an astronaut is like an Olympian, that was my aha moment when I realized that we can all learn how to succeed and we can all raise our bar of excellence. And the reason that's important is while it's great for us, if you're a leader, the reason you want to do this is because it'll just create a culture of excellence within your organization. The bar for that baseline is going to be raised. And once once people start improving and succeeding, Marshall, that is the best kind of addiction to have. And all of the people who aren't carrying their weight, that is just not going, no one's going to stand for that anymore. You have to step it up. Can you imagine the productivity and the impact we can have in the world if we can just raise that bar of excellence? We have it in us. We can learn how to do this. Yeah, I'm often asked that question, are leaders born or made? And my response is, so far, 100% of every leader I've ever met has indeed been born. Yes, they've all been born. So are leaders born? Yes, they are born. High achievers are indeed born. Yes, we're all born. I think it's such a silly question. If you're, if you're born to be some leader or you're born to be some astronaut, you're born to be something, you got to work. That's right. You got to work for it. You got to work. Yeah, you're not just quote, born there. You know, you got to work. It's but you know what? Work. You got to love it too. You have to love what you're doing. Right. I know so many lawyers who went to law school and then they don't practice law anymore because they just don't love it. Good. You have to find what you love to do. OK, what is the role of mentorship? What is the oh. role of mentorship as it relates to high achievers? So important, Marshall. So important. Seventy six percent of people understand the benefits of mentorship. You earn more you are promoted more often, you achieve more, but actually only 37% of people actually have one. But wow. every single high achiever had not just one mentor, but a team of mentors. They surrounded themselves with these people. Everyone had a different role, but these were the people who pushed them right out of their comfort zone. Because Marshall, what happens when we get too comfortable? No good. We start getting no complacent. Good. Now, I, right. I was just, just talking about this. My friend Judy Bardwick years ago wrote a book called Danger in the Comfort Zone. Mm. And, and speaking of mentors, one of the best mentors I ever had, Dr. Paul Hersey, he called me in and he said, you're making too much money. You're doing a great job. Your customers love you. I said, what's the problem? He said, too comfortable. Mm. You're, not, you're, not doing, you're not improving. You're just like a chicken with your head cut off selling days. You're never going to be the person you could become. Yeah. Unless you get uncomfortable. Yeah. That's such a great idea. Just a very, very counterintuitive idea. I read that in one of your books, Marshall. There you go. I read that story. <laughs> and it's so true. Because if you want to improve and you're sitting in the same chair doing the same old thing day in and day out, your mind's just going to go to sleep. You're just going to be on autopilot. If you really want to improve, every so often you need to step out of your comfort zone 
And that's what the mentors can really do because they will see it before yeah. you see it in yourself. Yeah, you know, of all the people in our 100 coaches, one uh, I'm very proud to know is Dr. Jim Kim. He saved 20 million lives. He has a great yeah. saying, though. Every day I wake up and create my legacy anew. Mm. Every day, you know, he's starting over. Every day's a new day. Every day's a new day. That's such a healthy way to look at life. That's yeah. such a healthy way to look at life. Yeah. Now, give some ideas about how can adults learn new things? I think really <laughs> it's opening yourself up to new ways. So we have been stuck for the last two years. And some people, and not everyone has had the easiest of circumstances in the last two years. Right. But people have taken the opportunity to try to do things either passively or actively to learn new things. Listen to a podcast while making dinner. Listen to a webinar while you're watching lunch. Do a LinkedIn learning course at some time during the weekend. People are finding different ways. And if you don't have the time, go grab that conversation with someone, either while you're taking a walk, while you're doing laundry. You can learn so much from other people. And you know that there are some people, all you need to do is spend 15 minutes with them. Your whole world will open up, right? Our conversations, Marshall, when we talk, we said, I remember I sat next to you at a dinner one time. And I think before we got to the main course, I was so blown away. I said, I could leave right now. I have learned so much already. Everyone needs to find people like that to surround themselves with. <coughs> and that you know will make you better. The idea of the 100 Coaches program was actually in in honor of the people who were mentors to me. Yeah. And just as my way of recognizing what they did for me. And so I, I think that's just such a healthy attitude. That's and we right. don't compete with our mentors. Nope. Quite the nope. contrary. They want us to succeed even more than they succeed. That's actually how they measure success. In fact, Marshall, you were at my at my book launch event and you met Dr. Bob Lefkowitz, who's a Nobel right. prize winner. He won the Nobel prize in 2012. Did you know that he shared his Nobel prize with one of his former mentees? They won it together. And I spoke to Bob about that. He is so honored and so thrilled. And I think that's a sign of such a great mentor who <laughs> realizes that a spotlight on someone else does not detract from the light on you. If anything, they see it as a marker of success. If one of my mentees succeeded, I had a hand in that. That's fantastic. And Marshall, I've spoken to many, many astronauts and they have assured me the world is big enough for all of us and for all of us to do great things. And we do not need to worry about someone else getting a spotlight. Well, this gives me a good challenge for you. Uh -oh. I want you to be an honorary mother of someone and you're going to adopt them and teach them all you know for free and just ask them to be part of our little club. I would be honored to do that. That's honored. Very that would be, that's very good. That's very good. Now, as opposed to people in general, how do high achievers deal with the concept of challenges? Yeah. You know, people think that they don't have challenges because they have notoriety, because they've done something amazing. They think they don't have challenges. Oh, they've got a lot of challenges. They have challenges just like the rest of us, sure. right? And uh, people forget that sometimes. But I spoke earlier about how um, the way they look at challenges, that it's not if, it's how. But the other thing, they're also not afraid to try. You know, some people, and I'm sure you've coached many, many people like this, a lot of people are afraid of failure. Yep. On the flip side, we have people who are afraid of success. Hmm. But the high achievers, they fear not trying more than they fear failing. Hmm. Fear not trying more than you fear failing because they have to try. They just have to. The, the, not doing it just doesn't seem possible. And mm. they look at every failure, not as a failure, as a learning opportunity. So I didn't get it this time. It'll happen next time. What can I learn from this experience? Right. In fact, Dr. Peggy Whitson, she's one of the astronauts who I interviewed. 
Do you know she she was working at NASA? Do you know she applied for 10 years to be an astronaut and she kept getting turned down? 10 years. When she was finally accepted, you know what ultimately happened? Oh, she became an astronaut, all right. She also became the first female commander of the International Space Station, a position she's held twice now. She became NASA's chief astronaut. And she has the record for more days in space than any American astronaut of any gender. Good thing she didn't quit when she was turned down the first time, the second time, the third time over that 10 year period. Good thing that she was always focused, if not if, but how. I know I'm gonna be an astronaut. What do I need to do in order to convince them that I'm right? She saw her potential. Her mentors saw her potential and she never quit. Never quit. Now that's a very positive story about not quitting. Yes. I'm not going to give you an unfortunate story. Okay. The unfortunate story is my book, What Got You Here, Won't You There, of all books on Amazon was ranked number one. I number one. <laughs> number one. Then, unfortunately, some other woman didn't quit. <laughs> And she wrote a book about someone called Harry Potter. <laughs> Harry Potter. And I was out. <laughs> the unfortunate thing, I'd have been better off had she quit, but she decided not to quit. So. <laughs> but you know what? You will always have that rank of number one. That's you will true. always have it. It's a great story, too. I get kicked out by Harry Potter. It's okay. <laughs> I don't have to apologize. It's all right. <laughs> but you and had you that. You had now, that. Now, you mentioned something that I totally agree with. That's the area of passion. If you love what you do, it is very different than if you do not love what you do. Yeah. Now, I think a lot of us just wait for this to beat us over the head. Yeah. Rather than look for it, we wait for it to look for us. That's right. How can someone find what they're passionate about in a proactive rather than what I think is a futile reactive way. That's right. If you're waiting for things to happen, you're going to be waiting a long time. Right. So I actually, the whole last third of the book is about action plans. Yes. Because as you said in the intro, I'm an adult educator. I develop leaders. I can't just tell you what to do without teaching you how to do it. And one of the things that I know is that, Marshall, what works for you is not going to work for me because we're different people. <coughs> yes. And what works for me today may not work for me the next time there's a transition, a move, a new job, a pandemic. So we need a buffet of options. Now, one of the items in the buffet of options for tapping into your passion is what I call a passion audit. And I actually teach everyone how to do this passion audit. It is really a simple three column exercise where I ask you some guiding questions to get you to think about what are you good at? What do people come to you for? Because they feel that you are the expert in your office, in your organization on this topic. Who are the people that you always like to work with? And that goes in one column. The second column has all the things that you don't enjoy doing. Or maybe it's the things that you're good at, but you don't enjoy doing. Or maybe it's the things that you really are not good at and therefore don't enjoy doing. These are usually the things we procrastinate doing because we don't like to do. Right. And that last column are things that we love to do. We do for free. We might already do them on weekends in some of the volunteer activities that we do. There's actually signs and clues all over our life of the things that we enjoy doing, even if we weren't going to get paid for it. And then we have to reimagine what if we can actually get paid for this, right? So it's all about the passion audit. And Marshall, because I'm an adult educator, I had to say what the elements were. I had to teach people how to do it. But what kind of an adult educator would I be without some online resources that come with the book that people can just download and it'll take you through the passion audit. It'll take you through a goal audit. It'll teach you how to build your own mentoring team. It gives you scripts for how to approach people if you're not an extrovert like Marshall and myself, <laughs> right? We don't have trouble with small talk, Marshall, right? <laughs> Now, you know, you mentioned this passion thing. Yeah. You have analyzed one of my biggest problems. My problem is I like what I do too much. 
Mm. So, yeah, I like coaching people. So if they need coaching, I give them coaching. They don't need coaching, give them coaching anyway. Uh, you know, I'm kind of a coachaholic. So sometimes I'm, I'm on an airplane, right? I'm on an eight-hour flight. This poor man sits next to me and says, what do you do for a living? Ah! Eight hours later, I look over, the poor guy's ready to kill himself. He's, why did I ask? <laughs> so, I think it's true for both of us. Great is the need of yeah. the student to learn. Yeah. Far greater is the need of the teacher to teach. Mm, so anyone so that's a teacher, you really are not, you kind of do it for them, but your need to teach is probably even greater than their need to learn. That's right. Speaking of learning, how do you develop a mentoring team? Yes. A mentoring team, a mentoring team is actually built of three layers. First, you have people who are senior to you. These are people who are experts. They have the expertise. They have a network, which hopefully they will share with you with those introductions. They understand the politics of an organization. They understand the culture. Now, those senior people also include retirees. These are very important people because they've got nothing holding them back. They know who will have your back and who will stab you in the back. So you want to make sure you have those people on there as well. That's the first layer. The second layer are people who are at your level, people we call peer mentors, for example. And the reason I say that is because they will understand, they will empathize with what you are going through right now. But remember, you're not going to be junior forever and peers rise together. In fact, I share the story in the success factor of the president of Simmons University, Dr. Lynn Wooten, and the Dean of Wharton, one of the top business schools, Dr. Erica James, the two of them are best friends and they're each other's mentors, what I call friend tours, they're friends and mentors. One's the president of a university, the other is the Dean of a top business school. But Marshall, they met in their twenties as graduate students at the University of Michigan. They were sitting next to each other at a lecture and they became so close. They talked to each other five times a week. They help each other out. They started their new jobs on the same day. So peers rise together. They weren't grad students forever. One's a president, one's a dean. And then, of course, you want people who are junior to you because you can learn from those people as well. They speak a different language. Some of them are digital natives. They have a different perspective. They understand that the communication style of today is very different than the communication style of just a few decades ago. So learning how to implement that, you want people who are junior to you in order to share that knowledge with you as well. And I actually share the story of Chris Walsh, Dr. Chris Walsh. He's an MD, PhD. He's the head of one of the departments at Harvard. And he needed, he's a big time neuroscientist, but he needed to learn molecular biology for something he was working on. So he went to someone who just finished college who was working in the lab, that person was the best molecular biologist on his floor. And that's the person who just finished college who was teaching a big time scientist how to do molecular biology. You always surround yourself with people and don't be afraid to learn from people who are different than you. Finally, it's my honor that you're one of our wonderful 100 coaches. It's my honor to talk with you. It's been so much fun. Do you have any final reflection you'd like to share with everyone? I want to share something that um, one of my mentors, Dr. Bert Shapiro, told me. And this was actually reinforced by Dr. Tony Fauci, who's one of the people I interviewed for the book. And I asked him, I said, how do you pick which projects to work on? Now, these two separate people gave me this great advice, and that's how I knew I needed to listen. They said, do something important, not just interesting. Because if it's interesting, it's a habit. It's a hobby. And it's right. interesting only to you. Right. But if it's important, it'll have an impact. And that'll have a ripple effect. And you can affect people in a positive way, people you have never met before and you'll never meet. But that's the way to have an impact on other people. Do something important, not just interesting. Hey, and finally, thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining me. It's been my honor. And I have one challenge for you in life. No. One day you're going to have an honorary daughter as neat as you. 
and get to interview that person on LinkedIn Live. And if that happens, you will be the luckiest person in the world. Oh, thank you, Marshall. Thank you for always being my guiding light. Thank you. And you know what we didn't tell people, Marshall? What? You wrote the forward to the book. Oh, that's true. You wrote the forward to the success factor. And I'm so thankful for that. <laughs> oh, so honored. Honored to write the forward for the book. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Wait, wait, Ruth. How do people contact you? Oh, my website, ruthgotian.com. All the social media is just my name, Ruth Gotian. And where to buy the book anywhere in the world, it's written down there. Ruthgotian.com slash book. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.